Okay, everybody, we're going to go ahead and get started. I want to, um, before uh, before I introduce Paul and, and we have our final keynote, I want to uh, take a moment to thank um, the Foster G North America Organizing Committee for what's been a really, really great event. I especially want to, I probably am going to miss somebody, but I especially want to start out thanking Guido Stein um, for his leadership and work and all this. And Guido, really appreciate it. Um, so much work, I, I, and I would like, if people who are on the committee at the end of Paul's keynote, if you want to come down here, we'll do a group photo. Um, I want to, uh, other people, the, the committee has been so great. Michelle Tobias, our community lead and, and social media outreach. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, Michael Turner uh, and Regina Obi. Regina was unfortunately unable to make it, and the, all the people on the program committee, uh, Ryan Burley, Bill Dollins, uh, for the all the work on um, the committee and then on uh, sponsorship. Um, Doug Newcomb, uh, Mike Williams and Jill uh, Jillian Long on volunteering. It's just fantastic. Uh, Matt Hansen, Vicky Vergara for all your work on the committee and a great keynote. Randy Hale, Eric Perper, Laura Wood Miller, James Cloninger and the Motif team for all their help. Maggie Colley and the OSM uh, US team for their help. And of course, Project Geospatial for doing our uh, videography. And we will, the, this session will be recorded. All the plenaries were recorded. The government sessions were recorded. That Geo Day is recovered recorded and they're going to be available in the next couple of weeks. The Project Geospatial website will uh, have them there. So if you have any trouble, just reach out and we'll get it. Okay, so I'm going to just, um, and I don't think I missed anybody, I'm sure. Oh, and thank you for the Delaney event staff, uh, Caitlin and Cindy, just fantastic work. That was really nice. And to all of our speakers, I mean, Thanks to all of you. I mean, you are all the speakers and, and Vicki, I think you did a, such a great job saying it's just us. You know, there's no big corporation or whatever. It's just us, you, your programs uh, have been so wonderful. So our closing keynote is going to be by Paul Ramsey. Paul, many of you know, uh, was co-founder of the Postages uh, Project in 2001. He's been so active in these uh, in the Phosphor G community as a speaker, as a leader. Uh, he's a senior geospatial engineer at Crunchy Data working with uh, some of the thorniest geospatial problems around. And it's really a privilege to have Paul uh, close out Foster G North America 2023 as our uh, closing keynote. Thank you, Paul. Okay, I was asked the organizing committee what you guys were all in, interested in hearing and self-righteous moralizing. <laughs> Will that, will that fit the bill? Because that's all I got. That's all I got. Um, yeah, so before we get started, uh, excuse me, this one little formality. Um, permission is hereby granted free of charge to any person obtaining a copy of this keynote to deal in the keynote without restriction, including without limitation the rights to use, copy, modify, merge, publish, distribute, sublicense, and or sell copies of the keynote, and to permit persons to whom the keynote is furnished to do so. Uh, this. This keynote is provided as is, <laughs> without warranty of any kind, express or implied, including but not limited to warranties of merchantability, fitness uh, for a particular purpose, or non-infringement. In no event shall the author be liable for any claim, damages, or other liability, whether in an action of contract, tort, or otherwise, arising from, out of, or in connection with the keynote, or the use, or other dealings with the keynote. Uh, got it? <laughs> uh, these are the terms of MIT No Attribution Open Source License, and just to be perfectly clear, I owe you all nothing. <laughs> and in return, reciprocally, you all owe me nothing. Uh, you do not have to pay me, not a lot, not a little. Uh, you can do whatever you want with this keynote. So here's a question. What value does it have? I am giving this keynote to you in exchange for nothing. So by basic economic principles, it must have no value. Um, at least if I am an economically rational self-maximizing entity of the sort our society is presumed to run upon. 
um, and you also are rational, rational self-maximizing entities, uh, then it must have no value, but um, am I a rational self-maximizing entity? Are you? Like, why are we here? We rational self-maximizing entities in a room all discussing worthless software <laughs> with people to whom we owe nothing at all. Like, clearly there is something missing in a classic microeconomic distillation of the open source phenomenon. Uh, the most obvious missing piece in the reductive economic approach is society, relationships, uh, non-monetary obligation, purpose, all the things that make us human. The other thing missing in this strange tale of worthless software, worthless valuable software, is that since the dawn of the free software era, this valuable worthless software has continued to evolve and grow and multiply in apparent defiance of the basic laws of economics. And I have a talk, half, half talk, written back on my desk about the morality of open source, but because of this strange paradox of worthless valuable software that grows and develops and outcompetes the alternatives, yet is controlled by no one, and free to all. Uh, because of this, I keep coming back helplessly to the topic of money. Money, 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 money. I mean, yes, uh, I like building open source for the engagement with the community and for the sense of purpose from seeing the software used all over the world, for enabling people who might otherwise never have the tools. And I like using open source for the flexibility, uh, the way it's developed from a perspective of user needs, not corporate monetization. And I like feeling useful, uh, knowing that my work has, been, has enabled other people to build and create things they might otherwise not have made. But, but also, um, I like buying groceries. And I have a crippling addiction to cafe lattes. I enjoy taking a hot shower from time to time and being out of the rain. And in this, I am not alone. Uh, there is a tension inherent in the core legal promise of open source. You owe me nothing. I would like to eat. And notwithstanding all that, being owed nothing, I'm clearly not starving. Um, I'm not even hungry. And, and that requires some explanation. So let me share two equally true facts about open source. Um, first, people are making an awful lot of money from open source software, myself included. And second, people are making basically no money at all from open source software, uh, myself included. So, so how do I manage this trick, making a lot of money and makes basically no money at all? Um, so there are a number of people like me whose salaries are paid by companies and institutions who want them to do nothing but wake up every day and make open source projects better and faster and stronger. Uh, one of these people is Linus Torvalds, uh, who created Linux and now works a, a very comfortable job for the Linux Foundation, which pays him handsomely, and in turn is supported with very significant donations from the largest companies in the world. So is Linus Torvalds making a lot of money from open source or a little? Well, Linus Torvalds is not the only person to create a world-changing operating system that completely reconfigures the technology industry. There is this other guy, too. Like Bill Gates managed that trick too about 15 years earlier and he's about 10,000 times richer. Uh, relatively speaking, Linus Torvalds created the foundational technology of our cloud computing infrastructure and managed to make basically no money at all. What's up with that? Well, the problem, the problem, if there is one, is that Linus Torvalds decided to work in the open and allow anyone else to use his source code for anything they wanted without restriction. And as a result, his software got more useful to more people more quickly than anything that Microsoft ever sold. It's just that the good part of the open source, the freedom, is not consistent with forcefully extracting fat stacks of dollars from the economy. And, and the Free Software Foundation has some bracing words about the virtue of software freedom um, in contrast to other development models. Uh, they say, there is nothing wrong with wanting pay for work or seeking to maximize one's income as long as one does not use means that are destructive. But the means customary in the field of software today are based on destruction. Extracting money from the users of a program by restricting their use of it is destructive. 
because the restrictions reduce the amount and the ways that the program can be used. This reduces the amount of wealth that humanity derives from the program. The Free Software Foundation very much does not consider Bill Gates to be a good citizen, notwithstanding the malaria fighting and polo fighting and the climate researching and all the other good stuff that he's funded since his original sins. Back in 1986, um, at the dawn of free software, Byte Magazine uh, interviewed Richard Stallman, the, at that point, undisgraced founder of the Free Software Foundation. And, uh, and I found this part really interesting. Um, Byte asks, a cynic might wonder how you earn your living. And Stallman answers, from consulting. When I do consulting, I always reserve the right to give away what I wrote for the consulting job. Also, I could be making my living by mailing copies of free software that I wrote and some that other people wrote but as long as I can go on making a living by consulting, I think that's the best way. And then by being curious, people ask, um, what is, what is uh, currently uh, included? I oh, lost my place. What is currently included in the official GNU dist distribution tape? And Stallman answers, uh, right now, <laughs> the tape contains GNU Emacs, Bison, MIT Scheme, and Hack. Now, before I go on, I want you to imagine mailing away money uh, $400 in today's money to MIT and getting back in return a magnetic tape containing Emacs, Bison, Scheme, and Hack. Close your eyes and luxuriate, right, in the idea of a computing environment so simple and pristine, but at the same time so empty and lonely that a tape copy of these weird bits and bobs is worth taking the time to mail away for. Ah, simpler times. Anyways, we live in the present, and from the original profit of free software, we get the following modes of making a living while not engaging in IP licensing or restricting the uses people can put software to. Consulting and mailing magnetic tapes around. Uh, so first, consulting. Uh, this, is, this is a huge one, and almost nobody talks about it much. But the simple expedient of holding knowledge in your head about a niche topic like a piece of open source software, and then selling access to that knowledge in the form of an hourly fee. This is really the whole game. Um, if I got laid off by crunchy data tomorrow, and I sincerely hope I do not, uh, the very next day I would be hanging up a shingle saying, come rent my knowledge of Postgres and Postgres and web mapping technology. Um, consulting really is the perfect match for open source software since there is no real barrier to entry. You find a piece of software that turns your crank you build up expertise in it, and then something, 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 something. Profit. Um, like so, for a new project or a small project, consulting is usually the only way for the project to capture value. Like the life cycle of most open source projects is to start very small, with a developer or user base of one. The developer is solving their own problem. Now, if the developer is very, very lucky and very good, they can build that initial seed up to a small community of users and maybe some other contributors. Uh, with even more luck, that community will bring the project into use at some institution somewhere that is willing to pay some money for some work. And at that point, according to the 2023 Tidelift Open Source Maintainer Survey, at that point they will join the 36% of open source developers who earn more than zero dollars from their work, although they will probably not join the 13% who earn most of their income from open source work. A number of the projects in our own ecosystem are developed largely on a consulting basis. GDAL, the ubiquitous image handling library, PDAL, the library handling library, QGIS, to a shocking degree, frankly, for a project of such size and influence, QGIS has developers earning livings through consulting. You can hear, perhaps, in my voice, a certain reticence about celebrating the consulting model uh, consulting can happen around projects of all sizes, of all maturities. It doesn't require startup funds or any particular organizational scale. Um, so you like, almost think like, is consulting the magic bullet? <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, no, it's a foundational piece uh, and to note that people with expertise can leverage that expertise into services revenue, but it has some serious issues when it comes to maintaining large pieces of critical software infrastructure. Um, first, the kind of business that consulting generates tends to be new features oriented. This is maybe fine when the software is new and growing for exploring capabilities, but as the software matures, it can lead to features that are built and then abandoned. 
and to a lack of focus on the kinds of things that customers don't want to pay for. Um, things like continuous integration, code modernization, platform support, packaging, documentation, all the things that add resilience and stability to software and community. Consulting can build projects that are large, but often fails to build projects that are strong. Uh, second, the intermittent nature of consulting can easily burn out contributors. Uh, I know quite a few people who ended up leaving open source work in favor of corporate stability. The project is not well served when the maintainers are living a precarious existence. They'll take on jobs that are bad for the project just for the money, or they'll just leave. And the project will risk abandonment if another maintainer does not come along. So, so what's the answer? Um, clearly, in an ideal world, there would be organizations that can consolidate the value that the world is getting from free and open source software and use that money to hire maintainers on a full-time basis at industry competitive wages. And that brings us to um, Richard Stallman's second source of free software income, selling those magnetic tapes, which as it happens is a specific example of distribution. When Stallman sold his funky tape uh, full of GNU program utilities, he was to some extent supporting his software development work since he worked on many of those projects. So in that respect, distribution was a revenue model that was feeding the underlying projects. But distribution revenue isn't restricted to just the people who work on the software. Free software is free. It's free to copy, free to change, free to do anything you want with. So distribution revenue won't necessarily go to people who are good at free software development. It will go to people who are good at distribution. Dun, dun, dun. So when I was installing Linux on my computers back in the late 90s, I would get a copy of the latest version of Red Hat by mailing an outfit um, called Walnut Creek Software, who would ship me a little stack of CD-ROMs. And this money was collected by Walnut Creek for the service of collating the software, burning it to a disk, and mailing it to me. Red Hat Linux, the business that actually built the distribution, compiling all the parts, integrating and testing the full operating system, they got nothing. And the thousands of people who actually wrote the software, the libraries, the utilities, the very kernel that Linus Torvalds was working on, unpaid as a finished graduate student at the time, got nothing. Distribution is an incredibly powerful choke point in the software economy because it is the place where convenience can be converted into dollars at the highest rate. And convenience is one of the few things that open source consumers will pay for. Before I get deep into distribution, I wanna, I wanna go back, uh, roll back to my rosy vision of organizations creating value around open source and using that income to pay for open source maintenance because I work for an organization like that. Uh, they are not just a theoretical construct or wishful thinking. Uh, there is a thing called a professional open source support company. Crunchy Data is a professional open source support company. Red Hat is also a professional open source support company. How does this work? Uh, what is the value that such companies provide? Why is it worth money? Uh, my favorite explanation of this model comes from a guy named James Dixon from Petaho, and he calls it the beekeeper model. Um, basically, the idea is that open source developers are kind of like bees. Um, they get together and they produce this wonderful, tasty honey, which you would love to eat, right? Um, but they also have this kind of alien culture that you don't understand. Um, and if you annoy them, they might sting you. <laughs> uh, particularly for big, stodgy enterprises with lots of internal rules and procedures, interacting directly with an open source community it's like trying to get honey in your tea by reaching your hand directly into a hive. Right? It is not going to end well. Um, what the stodgy enterprises need is an organization to mediate the relationship between the big stodgy end user organization and the freewheeling, weird, and potentially painful free software community. And the insight here is that there is a lot of value in this mediating role. There are things that a company that is alert to the needs of its clients can do, things that communities never will. One of the things that Crunchy Data did early in its existence, selling Postgres support into the US federal government, is to write a STIG for Postgres. Do you know what a STIG is? Yeah, there's some people nodding. Um, it is an unfathomably boring document. 
um, that walks you step by step on how to configure the software in a secure way. And only if your software has a stig that you have followed will be it approved for development or for deployment on government systems. Uh, every single component of a big government system from the OS to the database to the web servers will have an associated stig document. And believe me, there is no way I will ever write one unless someone backs up a huge dump truck of money in front of me. Uh, incidentally, there's also a thing called common criteria certification that requires us to review every single commit made to the code base. And in order to maintain Crunchy's common criteria certification of PostGIS, I regularly review every single commit to the PostGIS code base. It is not fun, <laughs> but it's my job and it creates value for some of our customers. Uh, so, so there's a model. There's a model that aggregates money from large institutional users of open source software, sufficient to pay full-time developers to continue the development and maintenance of free software. The professional open source support company. Problem solved? Eh, not really. Uh, like the consulting model, there's some serious deficiencies to this model. So, I mean, first, have a look at some of the companies that have made this model work. Red Hat Linux, SUSE Linux, uh, in the Linux space, Crunchy Data, EDB, in the Postgres space. What they have in common is supporting fairly low level infrastructural components and supporting their operations. Basically, people don't pay for support until they go to production, and they only pay for production support for systems that are mission critical. So Linux only became a product that occasioned enterprise support when enterprises actually started running mission, mission critical workloads on it, which was really quite recently, like as these things go. So, so this is all well and good for infrastructural software, but it doesn't do much for front-end tooling, it doesn't do much for data science, user-facing desktop software like QGIS. The professional support model found a niche, and a good niche in mission-critical production deployment, but not much more. Um, I'm gonna skip over two monetization models, um, dual licensing and open core, because I think they are fundamentally broken in that they are just tweaks on proprietary licensing of intellectual property. Like the long run trajectory of these models is toward corporate control, not community expansion. Like for example, here is a partial, partial, partial list of well-known open core companies that no longer distribute their software under open source. Why? They're all profitable, but none of them presumably was profitable enough for the venture capital boards. So they dumped their open source licensing. Um, so I really don't think that relicensing or open core are gonna be the most important future models for building value around open source. The model I do think important um, and will stay important for the next 10 years is open source in the cloud. Open source on the cloud, I mean, it's just another twist on distribution as a locus of value extraction. Just like the CD-ROM, it's the software company that mailed me CD-ROMs, uh, the cloud providers can sit at the choke point of convenience and charge money for open source, while the open source communities behind that choke point very often receive nothing. They are not required to support the communities, and by and large, until quite recently, they mostly haven't. And this is entirely their right. Although it's not super smart, since it starves the very projects that they're monetizing. Uh, it's not difficult to put hard numbers on the amount of money that cloud providers are extracting from the value of open source software. And this is an example around Postgres, but you can build it around other things. Uh, you can rent an AWS T3 2X large instance running Linux for 33.28 cents per hour. You can rent that same instance as an RDS database instance running Postgres, and AWS will charge you 57.9 cents per hour. So the Postgres premium that AWS is charging and putting directly into its pocket is 24.6 cents per hour. That's real money. Like that's almost half the cost. Many, many millions of dollars that AWS is receiving directly for running open source software on its infrastructure. And the open source deal where they owe the authors nothing, that deal is working out real well for them. Um, I first made this point publicly at a talk uh, at Foster G North America in 2019. And, and some people at AWS, they got, they got a little prickly about it. Uh, they said, there's a false equivalence in that slide. Using RDS is not the same as launching EC2 and downloading a database engine. It provides many additional features. Okay, fair point. 
Um, in slicing up the total value of the AWS offering of the server in the database, I missed a slice, right? The AWS management backplane. So I wondered, like, how much was that backplane worth? So I asked, how much of the value over and above bare EC2 would you say AWS, the AWS part of RDS is providing? 10%, 20%, 50%, 80%? To which he replied, I don't know the answer to that. It depends on what it would cost a specific customer to build and operate those capabilities. <laughs> which made me a little mad, right? The implication is that all the money that customers are paying for RDS is for the server in the back plane. That's the only thing of value in the offering, the only thing customers are paying for which is completely, completely infuriating, right? And also, well, correct? <laughs> Customers have the option of running manually assembled EC2 post Postgres combinations, and they largely don't. They pay the premium for RDS. Ergo, the premium must be entirely the management backplane. That sucks, <laughs> right? <laughs> And it still doesn't seem fair. The backplane's worthless without the database. But AWS not only takes the money, they also somehow manage to take the credit, too. They provide value worth paying for. The Postgres open source community somehow does not. If this were the whole story on the cloud, which is gonna be the preeminent purveyor of open source for the next generation, this would be very, very bad news indeed. Um, but the news is not all bad. Now, I pointed out earlier that Red Hat Linux uh, employs Linux experts to work on the software and to backstop their claimed ability to support the software for enterprises. Like This is the same promise Crunchy makes for Postgres and Postgres. It's why we employ Tom Lane and Stephen Frost and other longtime Postgres experts, and also me and Martin Davis on the spatial side. It's not too much of a reach to imagine a world in which the cloud providers need to employ contributors to the projects they spin to demonstrate their ability to support the software they're running for corporations and governments and other serious organizations in the world. Back in 2019, when I first rolled out my AWS premium argument, I pointed out that at that point, AWS employed exactly one of 28 active Postgres contributors, which was frankly one more than I thought they employed. That seemed like a travesty, given the amount of value they were extracting from the software. Uh, that is also, four years later, here in 2023, no longer true. Um, AWS employs a number of committers and community members. Similarly, Azure employs a number of active contributors. Ironically, Google, which was a very early corporate proponent of open source, um, really lags the field of the big three in this particular metric. If you poke around major infrastructural open source projects that are spun in the clouds now, it's pretty common to find major contributors who are also cloud employees. It seems like, finally, the big clouds, big tech, big corporate users of open source in general are slowly coming to terms with the fact that if they do not directly support some open source development, the goose that lays the golden eggs won't survive. Or even worse, it will survive as a zombie goose that lays occasional eggs of shit. <laughs> in 2014, the Heartbleed bug in OpenSSL opened up every secure service on the web to zero day remote access exploits. It was a big deal. They wrote about it in the newspaper. <laughs> it cost the big providers millions to remediate, and it was caused by a very small ch change in the OpenSSL library that was introduced because the maintainer of OpenSSL, and there was only one full-time maintainer at that point, was overworked, underpaid, and making what money he did through the venerable activity of consulting. He had paid contracts to add features, but maintenance was done on his own time. Mistakes were made. And afterwards, the big cloud providers got together and created the Core Infrastructure Initiative, which is basically a big pot of money they direct to projects that need sustainability funding. It's a very self-interested initiative. Um, but that's in many ways a good thing. If big companies are finally starting to realize that it is in their self-interest to fund development that is not necessarily immediately monetizable. That money spent today on open source maintenance will save money tomorrow in higher reliability, security, and quality. At least, maybe they're realizing that, maybe not. 
Um, back in our own world of geospatial, you have all probably heard about the GDAL project. Um, the GDAL project is a library and set of command line tools that allow you to read and write any of dozens of imagery formats and to apply common transformations to that imagery, resampling, reprojecting, masking, color mapping, even contouring or applying kernel features to the rasters. You can use GDAL on its own inside scripting languages. You can use it inside QGIS, inside PostGIS, inside Google Earth, anywhere geospatial images and rasters show up. And over the last 10 years, the default place for large imagery collectors to dump their imagery has been the cloud. And the tool they use to do processing of that data, both before storing it and after, is usually GDAL, or a scripting language like Python wrapped around GDAL. There's really no alternative technology. GDAL either works well, or the trains stop running. So, who's getting business value from GDAL? Well, <laughs> thousands of people on an individual basis, folks here, but on an aggregate organizational basis, the big imagery creators and the cloud providers whose storage is only useful because GDAL can access their imagery directly and efficiently. And so one of the most positive and most surprising developments in open source funding the last few years happened when the GDAL project was able to fundraise over a quarter million dollars in recurring funding from big cloud companies, big satellite imagery companies, and big space companies. Not funding for feature development, not consulting work, but funding for specific or non-specific maintenance and core enhancements. Big companies were finally supporting the infrastructure they run on. Uh, the GDAL project used an existing nonprofit, non NumFocus, as the banker to invoice the sponsors and manage the account. And that GDAL money was used to support 50% of core developer Evan Rowell's time, and he still made the other half doing normal open source consulting. Some of the funds were spent to maintain libraries that GDAL depends on, even further upstream. The GEOS project, for example, is used by GDAL for computational geometry support. GEOS got funding from GDAL for six months of core maintenance work, which has resulted in a cleaner, faster, more future-friendly code base. I gave a shorter version of this talk, like just six months ago, and I concluded, I was done, whoop, that maybe finally things are getting better. Yes, the clouds are creaming off most of the monetary benefit of open source, but they were starting to feed back into these communities by hiring core contributors and incubating new contributors and their staffs by doing sponsorships. And the GDAL example seemed like a wonderful one in which the major corporations shared the burden via sponsorship. No one company, not even a really huge dedicated imagery company, needs to hire a full-time GDAL developer. But in aggregate, altogether, they could each purchase 20% of a GDAL developer. So yeah, my internal unicorn was jumping over rainbows. And then, and then, uh, this spring, NumFocus started calling around the sponsors for renewals. And one after one, after the whole year of sponsorship, the big corporations all started dropping off. AWS, Maxar, Planet. Now Planet had had a round of layoffs this summer and is losing money, that's fine. Okay, life comes at you fast. But AWS, <laughs> AWS pulled in first quarter revenue of $21 billion last year, first quarter, with 25% gross margins. Uh, this is very much a live situation. Um, the GDAL team called their contacts in AWS and Max and Planet, and the message coming back was generally that management didn't see the business case for the sponsorship. Now, the business case had been made the previous year. That's how the sponsorship was in place. But the internal context had to make the case all over again. So as the moment I'm writing this, um, AWS, AWS has restored their full sponsorship. Maxar has restored a smaller one. Planet is still deciding. Microsoft and Esri are both hanging in there as sponsored. Um, while it's great that the GDAL funding is still mostly in place, things have gotten better again, it's maybe questioned the core premise of the effort. And the core premise is that corporations could ever fully appreciate the operational importance of supporting the open source software they leverage value out of. The individuals, the people we talk about, talk to inside the companies, they get it. They understand, they convey the message upward, but the organization itself is constantly thermostatically returning to the plain fact that with open source, it says right on the package, they owe nothing. And our allies in these corporations, they have lives and careers, they won't be in the corporation forever, they won't be willing to spend reputational capital on the effort forever. 
This would be the moment for someone in the audience to stand up and yell, corporations are just maximizing shareholder value. Corporations are just maximizing shareholder value, <laughs> idiot. <laughs> I don't see that. <laughs> and... <laughs> And, and my answer, <laughs> my answer would be, you know, I'm 52 years old, so I'm a young man, but that's still just old enough to remember that maximizing shareholder value was once a new idea. Um, that there used to be a different rule. As recently as 1980, managing to maximize value over a number of stakeholder groups. Shareholders, yes, but also employees, customers, suppliers, and local community. That was considered the corporate management best practice. There's nothing special about the way things are done now, except they happen to be the way things are done now. I talked earlier about Linus Torvalds and Bill Gates and the huge disparity in the amount of value they captured for themselves and their families. A few millions for Torvalds, hundreds of billions for Gates. So, big win for personal avarice, right? Except, why do we stop counting once we've totted up how much money these men have personally extracted from the economy? For example, the first Google production, or Google production rack was built with a mix of proprietary Sun hardware and Linux servers. Google quickly became and remains a 100% Linux-based company. Imagine if they had had to buy all their servers from Sun. How much additional Linux-created value resides in the pockets of Sergey Brin and Larry Page? Similarly, Facebook was started with MySQL and PHP running on Linux servers. Thanks, Mark. Um, <laughs> big chunks of it still use that stack. Like in a counterfactual world where Windows was the only operating system, how does Facebook grow to be as valuable as Microsoft? How much of that Facebook value is Linux and PHP and MySQL value? Economists have a word for the things they cannot account for in their models of the world. They call them externalities. And the usual example is factories dumping waste into public rivers, converting the cost of dealing with pollution from a private expense to a public expense. And it goes largely unremarked, but the whole internet economy of the past 20 years has been the beneficiary of a massive externality in the acquiring of service systems that in the ordinary course of affairs would have been hugely expensive. Operating systems, databases, language, development tools, all obtained for zero dollars in capital investment. Google, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Airbnb, GitHub, the pretty much every billion dollar startup has been constructed through the slapping together of a vast collection of open source software components. Now these have been immensely clever collections of software components combined with deft market making and messaging, so credit where credit is due. But remember, no matter how clever the brick builder is, he is not going to be able to build much of a house without bricks. So let's update our evaluation of Bill Gates and Linus Torvalds. How does our evaluation of these two extraordinarily consequential innovators change? If instead of asking ourselves how much value they captured in the market, we instead ask ourselves how much value they created for society. It's a very different valuation, isn't it? On that metric, Linus Torvalds' social capital is just as impressive as Bill Gates. And why would we care you know, how much value they created? Because we live in a society and we all share in that created value in a way we do not necessarily share in that market captured value. As a society, we already recognize that markets are bad at solving certain kinds of problems. Here's a thought experiment. What would the interstate highway system look like if it was built and maintained entirely by a voluntary consortium of trucking companies. <laughs> like, pretty bad, pretty bad, right? And yet this is the model. This is the model we continue to apply to the digital infrastructure that runs our economy. The gravel and cement and asphalt of the 21st century are libraries and languages and operating systems that are currently being maintained by voluntary consortia of their users. So on the one hand, here we are, economically rational entities, satisfied users of all this software, 
that our economy values at nothing. Something is working. Why argue with success? On the other hand, even the single most foundational project, the most successful project in the whole open source world, Linux, is having problems that would be completely familiar to the maintainers of GDAL or any of the other small geospatial libraries. This article, uh, long-term support for Linux kernel to be cut as maintenance remains under strain. This article showed up in my newsfeed literally while I was writing this speech. And it is a testament to the success of the status quo. Um, there are 2,000 developers involved in Linux, many of them full-time employees of a wide range of corporations. That is a huge success. But, like, just like any other consulting company, these corporate customers, these corporate employers of Linux developers are paying for them to add features while expecting the community work of project maintenance to happen for free in their spare time. So Joseph Bachik, Linux kernel file system developer and maintainer, Maintainers are burning out because maintainers don't scale. Derek Wong, another senior, senior Linux admin, kernel maintainer, this cannot stand. We need help. What the Linux maintainers are dealing with, what you can hear other maintainers complain about, what you can get me to complain about with very little prompting, <laughs> this is the open source bargain. And it looks on the surface to be a very poor bargain indeed. You will get very little money for changing the world. But the reverse is also true, and it is so, 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 so very important. You can change the world for very little money. The very thing that makes it hard for open source to capture value, the freedoms granted by the license, allows open source to create immense amounts of value, because there is nothing stopping anyone from using it for anything, anywhere. That leverage, is so large that relatively small contributions can have huge effects. And as a result, there's truly no organization too small to make a big impact in the open source world. Um, because we're here in the DC metro area, I am sure there are a lot of civil servants in the room, civil servants. Yeah. Woo! It's here for civil service. Which is great. Um, in an only very slightly different alternate universe, I would be a British Columbia civil servant. Um, I was one for a short time early in my career. And I appreciated the sense of public spirit and purpose. Um, my friend uh, and professional mentor, Mark Sondheim, was a civil servant in the British Columbia government. He died earlier this year at the age of 70. You have probably not heard of him before. He never progressed any higher than a program manager. He never managed an annual budget of more than a few million dollars. And yet I can almost guarantee you that everyone, everyone in this room uses software that he brought into being and kept vital. Post just came into being in 2001 in my small geospatial consulting company. The very first production post just system stored 1.5 million records of the British Columbia Digital Road Atlas. This is a program that Mark managed. In addition, to giving us his early vote of confidence, letting us use Postgis for his program, Mark let us devote part of our Digital Roads contract budget to maintenance and development of Postgis. Just as companies can charge money for activities that are adjacent to open source software, consulting or standards or certification or support or distribution, so too government can spend money via open source adjacent projects on open source maintenance and development. What made Mark really unique, though, as a civil servant, was his desire to innovate from within government. And in later years, to multiply the impact of that innovation using open source licensing. So I won't talk about his early projects, which predated the free software era. But I will talk about his greatest successes, JTS and GIOS. Uh, in the late 90s, Mark was frustrated that every piece of GIS processing seemed to be tied to a GIS system. And it was clear that geospatial was moving beyond the desktop, but the whole industry was still slave to the desktop model and, and worse to desktop pricing. He dreamed of GIS without the GIS. And that was, that was a big dream in the late 90s, but he had a long-term plan. And that started with a computational geometry library, a foundational library to define the core geometry objects and the basic operations on those objects. And the OpenGIS Simple Features Standard provided the design template. Now Mark got $250,000 from a federal government innovation fund, 
and he contracted a local company to build this library. And in the contract, he specified two things. First, that the copyright would be held by the company, not the queen. And second, that the software would be released under an open source license. Now, the first requirement ensured the government didn't lock up the software in an intellectual property office. And the second requirement ensured that the company didn't do basically the same thing. The result was the JTS topology suite, the Java topology suite, which you'll find in GeoServer and GeoTools and any other spatial software in Java. JTS was translated into C++ and connected to PostGIS by my company a few months after JTS was first released. That C++ port is called GEOS, and you'll find it in PostGIS and GDAL and QGIS, Shapely, really any other C or C++-based open software. You'll also find JavaScript ports in your web maps. You'll find Golang ports and Rust ports and so on. It is truly a foundational piece of infrastructure, and it only exists because of the innovative spirit of a single British Columbia civil servant. Just as we've forgotten that corporations used to care more about, shell, more, about more than shareholder value, we've forgotten the government used to consider itself a source of innovation. And not derivative value capturing innovation, like the cell phone taxi service or the hotel in your house service, but foundational value creating innovation. Who created the basic research that led to electronic computing? The Army. Who was the first customer for the integrated circuit? The Air Force. Who built the first internet works and brought the first routers? DARPA. Where was the World Wide Web invited, invented? CERN. Where was the first graphical web browser developed? The University of Illinois. Who built GRASS, GIS? The US Army Corps of Engineers. And why is there still an active research and open community around GRASS? Because someone in the Corps, I'd love to know the story, someone in the Corps had the smarts to open source it in 1999. Government and civil servants can develop and seed new innovations and lay down infrastructure that will be used for decades to come. It doesn't even take a great deal of money. It just takes the vision to look a little distance over the horizon. Over the horizon, I hope, is a new status quo in which we get beyond the minimalist open source obligations. Sure, I owe you nothing. You owe me nothing. Those are the rules. But beyond the rules, there is the context. We do, in fact, depend on each other. We do live in a society. So what can we be doing in the complicated and intransigent present to make this society better? We all have our roles and we all have our context. What can we do now? Open source developers and maintainers. They need to recognize that money can be surprisingly hard to move and they need to be proactive to build the channels for money to flow for them. Like no amount of goodwill in the world will help fund open source maintenance if the channels are not there for the money to flow. Yes, we have consulting, we have professional open source companies, we have sponsorship programs, we have GitHub sponsorships and Patreon, we still need more. Uh, one of the key success factors of the GDO maintenance fund was bringing NumFocus, an existing organization with financial controls and full-time staff to handle the logistics of moving money, bringing NumFocus into the picture. It made working with the large corporations way easier. But even so, that's not enough because the sponsorship model doesn't work for the broader public sector. Governments are mostly not allowed to do sponsorship. We need to do better. Open source maintainers also need to keep innovating on models to monetize their value add. The primary value add developers have above raw software is their human capital, their knowledge and their social connections to other developers. How do we monetize that? Mostly we give it away. We give it away on message boards and at conferences like this one. The most common monetization strategy is the one I've used for the last 10 years, is work directly for a company willing to pay for that open source human capital. But that doesn't work for many organizations that can't afford to hire one whole human. Um, my colleague Howard Butler at Hobu has been experimenting with a new model lately of providing fractional development support for Pedal, uh, delivered live via Slack. It's a novel approach. It opens up another channel for the money to flow in increments smaller than a whole developer without tying the money to new feature development. We need more business innovation of this sort. Open source development is a partner between users and developers. And developers, we need to do our part. 
But one of the big surprises I found, particularly after giving a speech like this, one of the big surprises I found around open source and money is how frequently organizations are willing to fund. It's like, oh, you need money? Boy, we can get you money. Once they know there's an administratively simple way to move the money, it's about moving it. It's not about having it or even having the will to spend it. It's about opening up the mechanisms to move it. The private sector uses are open source. They need to step up to the funding channels that already exist. There's already lots of mechanisms for project sponsorships and for micro donations via GitHub and Patreon. These mechanisms are mostly ignored by corporate users, but they shouldn't be because to ignore them is to build castles of software on foundations of sand. A recent change I've noticed is that large software organizations um, are carefully mapping out their software dependency chains for legal and licensing purposes. Uh, the EU CRA, that's probably going to result in even more of this so-called supply chain, software supply chain mapping. These maps should be used not just as compliance tools, not just as liability shields, they should be used as investment tools. These maps show you what software you depend on. So make sure that you keep it alive and healthy. What you do not water will not grow. For software organizations making money by monetizing open source, and naturally I'm staring aggressively at cloud vendors, they need to step up and directly fund and staff the maintenance of the software they spin and the critical dependencies of that software. These are big organizations. They know the dependency structure of their software. They have open source program offices. There is no excuse. They are doing better. The directionality is good. They need to do more still. Finally, the public sector. And I lay a lot at the feet of the public sector um, because it is the foundational institution of our society. And we are talking here about society building. If the public sector does not lead, the rest of society cannot be expected to follow. Do we truly believe that open source software is infrastructure? If we believe it, then the public sector should act like it is. Like in the short term, follow the example of my friend Mark. Be creative with funding vehicles already in your grasp. Insist contractually that your vendors work in the open, that they make them, make them deliver under open source licenses, managed in public, with complete documentation and reproducible builds. Pay a little more for good development practices. Break applications up into reusable, generic core components and the parts specific to you. Insist on reuse of common upstream libraries and pay for contributions to those libraries as a normalized part of development. Remember, modern software is not built with a million commits to one repository. It's built of work spread out across a huge collection of software that is then brought together to solve a problem. If your vendor is not working and frankly billing you to improve upstream libraries, then they are working against your interests and against society's long-term interests. Get rid of them. In the longer term, use the power of the purse. Um, cloud software is going to be required to submit bills and materials, software chains of dependency. That is a roadmap to a requirement that some percentage of spend be spent on maintenance. No one should be selling software to government that they aren't also spending effort or dollars to maintain. Insist on smart ethical behavior from your vendors. This should become part of the standard contract templates, just as much as insurance clauses and security clauses already are. There's nothing mysterious about insisting on maintenance. It's just insisting on insurance. And it's what we expect from any other piece of public infrastructure. I started off this talk by telling you what you owe me, which is nothing, which is what I owe you. I do, however, have a debt to society, the society that has educated and supported me and kept me safe these 52 years. I owe it the care to do a good job, and I owe it enough future focus to ensure that the software I care for will survive me. You all owe society something too, depending on your context, your life condition, your purpose, and your skills. What do we owe each other? What we owe each other is everything we need what we owe each other is everything we can afford to give. Thank you very much.